there's a show before this show, and it's the pre-con where I finally get an opportunity to show people that the functional movement screen isn't as complicated as they might think. A lot of people take a functional movement screen workshop and, and they learn how to do the screen, but then when they get the information from the screen, it all gets complicated. Which exercise do I pick? Do I restrict workout? How do I get to programming from the movement screen information? Well, we get an opportunity to get a bunch of people in one room for four or five hours and actually real time screen some people from the audience and then program them on the fly. It is my goal right here for you to show you that once you get the movement screen on the score sheet, you literally have the power to program somebody based on their movement profile. This is gonna be exciting, it's unrehearsed, and everybody we're gonna to screen today doesn't even know they're getting screened yet because we're gonna pick them out of the audience. So it's gonna be a really interesting thing and you're gonna to get to see how we interact with multiple age groups, multiple sports, body types, everything, because the movement screen is not sport specific or activity specific. It's species specific, and that's what we're working with. We're all humans, we all gotta move, we just gotta profile our movement patterns if we're gonna make conditioning and exercise programs. So I hope you enjoy this. Back to the movement screen. I want you to see the low hanging fruit here. Everybody's looking at all these tests saying, oh my gosh, I got an 80 year old. Their heart's gonna explode when they do that. Let's go. Here's your movement screen. How's it look now? You got anybody that probably shouldn't do that or do that? I'm sure you can find someone, but in a majority, can 90% of your clientele lay on their back and lift a leg? Can they do this? And if so, we need to do that. You know why? Because that's more than a hamstring test and that's more than a shoulder test. We call this shoulder mobility, we call this active straight leg raise. The shoulder mobility is called shoulder mobility not for your purposes because it's got nothing to do with the shoulder in a majority stance. It's got a lot to do with the T-spine. If medically I'm looking at your core, if medically I'm consulting on the way your abs fire and your low back works, I'm going to put you in quadrants. And how many people in orthopedic medicine use upper and lower quadrants? Well, here's a quadrant. My shoulder, my neck, and my T-spine are one functional unit. Any one thing is out, we got a problem. So we never consider the shoulder without the neck, the scapula, and the rib cage. We never consider this shoulder without the same neck, scapula, and rib cage. We never consider this hip without considering the pelvis, spine, and core. I'm looking at you in quadrants. So that's your lower quadrant symmetry test for core stability, and that's your upper quadrant. The human limbs almost always want to move in reciprocal fashion. I gain power going up by pushing back. Crawling starts our symmetry, and it does it with reciprocal motion. I don't just need you to lift your leg, I need you to maintain that one in a perfectly still state. When you see somebody who can't do this, if you bark out tight hamstring, Brett's gonna come around, take the dowel, whoosh, hit you. Cause, there's two other things that can cause a limitation in leg raise right there. Poor pelvic control and a restriction of hip extension on the opposite side. If you can't extend this hip and you got that laying on the ground, then there's a good chance you've arched your back just to get this leg on the ground, which keeps you from lifting this leg high. So you don't see somebody do poorly on this test and say, oh, that's a tight hamstring. You say there's a limitation in your right leg raising. What are some of the issues that could do it? Well, stability through the core, mobility in one hip extension or alternate hip flexion. So we are exercising, stretching, and moving a pattern, not a single muscle group. Because if you focus only on the up leg, you won't change this that much. If you focus only on the arm that won't internally or externally rotate, you're forgetting the fact that if you ask a six-year-old to do this, they would go, oh. And if you've got some guy off the bench press this afternoon to do this, he'd be like, all right. How's that look? Children don't need to be told to know that T-spine extension precede scapular stability, precede shoulder mobility. It's intuitive. If I need my arms back there, I'm going to do everything I can with my spine to help that. Whereas now, when we see this as fitness kinesiologists, we say, external rotation flexion, internal rotation extension. I wonder how far that'll go. If it won't, we got to start cranking on shoulders. No. Brett can show you. Just laying them on their stomach and doing crocodile breath and giving them their rib cage back, just working on T-spine extension, rotation, and side bending, 
can change this test without stretching the pecs, the lats, or anything. Now, once you get the T-spine normal, you may have some shoulder issues, but going central first is really what this is all about. Not going to the limbs first. You see the dysfunction in the limbs, but we don't go there. These are your mobility issues, right? And if you have a young, old, professional athlete, it doesn't matter. If one of these isn't acceptable, I didn't say perfect, one means you can't complete the test by standards. That's dysfunction. Two means an acceptable range. Three means you did it perfect. You get twos, and we're going to show you how to talk about that. You're going to watch the screen. You get twos on that. Then we're interested in your rotary stability. That's a crawling pattern.